Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid I've got to change the mood a little. The first thing I'd like to do is to make a dedication. Two meetings ago, there was a Légion d'honneur circulated among all the members here. And I would now like to dedicate it to the squadron guys who are not here. There's only two of us left. And this particular uh, award is only issued to people still on their feet. It is not issued to anyone posthumously. So I just simply am one of the lucky ones. So having got that off my chest, we'll now talk about uh, talk about flying and the squadron. And uh, we'll start off with my early days in gliding. Now this kept me out of mischief for a couple of years, actually. We uh, had a hangar down at City Beach, and we used to leave our headquarters at uh, West Subiaco Airfield along the old Plank Road, if any one of you ever remember it, <laughs> out to City Beach. And there we would enjoy ourselves shock cord launching the, the uh, primary glider out over the water into the sea breeze. Now, most of the reason for that is that uh, we found that at West Subi, when we were doing towing, that <coughs> we smashed the thing up too much. Most of the guys always ended up with crash landings. This way, if we landed in the water, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't damage the primary glider. <coughs> we could haul it in and have another go. The shock cord is this, this thing here, which is about that round to start off with. And it's attached to the hook in the front of the, the sailplane, or the, <coughs> the glider. And you get three or four guys on each end and you have an enormous catapult. Two guys hanging on the back and then when <laughs> somebody raised an arm, they let go and you shot up to about 200 feet and did your best to turn around and land back on the, on, the, uh, on the sand again. If you didn't manage it, it was no problem. They just haul, hauled you in on the next wave. So, and then they could dry it out and start again. Now, from this early stage, I then managed to get a, a job with McRobertson Miller so that's West Subiaco Airport. And with Robertson Miller, in those days they were flying the old DH-86, which wasn't a popular airplane with anyone. Eventually they superseded it with the Lockheed Electra. It's the first all-metal aircraft they had, and it was extremely popular. My problem now was that all my mates from the gliding club were joining the Air Force. I was trapped in a section that I couldn't get out of. In other words, it was, yeah, that's right. So the government said, no, no, you're better off as an engineer than you would be if you joined the Air Force. Of course, that didn't sit very well with me, so it took me a little while to convince both Harry Miller and Frank Cahoon that I really would much prefer to be in the Air Force and that they weren't really getting the very best out of me. So they did eventually release me with the permission of my family because it was quite a, a big thing in those days to have an apprenticeship and it was very much valued and also it was very difficult to get out of. You had to get full permission from everybody to break, break that uh, that thing. So after about two and a half years as an apprentice engineer, I managed to join the Air Force. Then I went through normal RAAF flying. 
PS output for the normal square bashing, then over to Parafield for um, for um, Tiger Moth training, initial training, and then back to Geraldton for advanced training. After that, they gave me a commission and they sent me away as an above average pilot. Unfortunately, to a staff pilot's job at, uh, at Parks in New South Wales. However, since Parks in New South Wales was a navigation school, I took the opportunity of doing a navigation course while I was there, which probably was one of the reasons why I ended up on, on Sunderland's. <laughs> so after that, after about six months of that, they sent me down to Melbourne, put me on a boat and sent me over with a lot of other fellows on the way to the UK. We crossed the Pacific and uh, then boarded a train at San Francisco to cross the continent to Boston. Now, crossing the continent was quite a, quite a long, tedious business for, say, the 40 or 50 air crew that were in that draft. And by the time we got to Salt Lake City, everyone was bored and fed up with being stuck in a, in a train. So the CO, in his wisdom, decided that he would arrange a march through Salt Lake City very innocent man, the CEO. So he lined up the uh, a local band, I think it was the fire brigade band, and then he got all the guys out on the platform, lined them up with the officers, and then the other ranks, and the, uh, the CEO directly behind the, the band. Then the band started up, and off we went down the main street of Salt Lake City, enormous crowds, after, I think, about three blocks, all that was left of the parade was the band and the CO. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, it took more than two days to round them all up again, probably due to the hospitality of the folk of Salt Lake City. So then, uh, off to Boston, and uh, after a little while in Boston, down to New York, we were then put on a ship called the Mauritania, which sailed alone because of its speed. Uh, and uh, we zigzagged our way across the Atlantic to the UK. From Scotland, where we landed, we were taken down to Brighton, which was the PDRC for overseas uh, aircrew, the Canadians and uh, Australians. Now, from there, you were sent to various commands, rhythm, fighter command, bomber command, coastal command, and of course everyone wanted to be a fighter pilot, naturally. They were the glamour boys and we all wanted the glamour. <laughs> Even night fighters would have done, so we all ate a lot of carrots to improve our <laughs> night vision. But it was all to no avail. Fortunately for us, uh, a delegation from 10 Squadron, never heard of it, came up to Brighton to interview various people to replace losses of the, in their squadron. They wanted uh, three pilots and uh, navigators and wireless operators and various people. So we volunteered for that because they promised us that we would actually be in operations in two weeks. Now, the rest of the guys were sitting around Brighton, and if they went into bomber command, they had to go to a, AFUs, and then OTUs, and then finally onto a squadron, and everyone said, good God, at this rate, the war will be over. <laughs> anyway, as far as we were concerned, there were three of us, and uh, we went down to Plymouth, and believe it or not, we were actually in operations in two weeks. 10 Squadron, I knew nothing about it. It was quite an elite squadron. It was formed in 1938 
by the RAAF to have a reconnaissance squadron. They purchased these Sunderland flying boats from the United Kingdom and sent crews over to the UK to be trained and eventually fly the aircraft back. However, the war broke out and the government in their wisdom decided to to relieve the squadron in England as their first effort towards assisting the United Kingdom in the war. So that we were the first operational squadron in the United Kingdom in 1939. Coastal Command, you know, you've heard a lot about Fighter Command because they were the Glamour Boys. You've heard about Bomber Command because they actually just ruined the Nazi regime. <laughs> Coastal Command, you didn't hear much about. And there was a reason for that. The Battle of the Atlantic was started in 39, and in that month alone, they, they, the Germans sank 53 ships. Not one word about shipping should ever be uh, released to the public. And that would assist the Germans. And believe it or not, there were a lot of sympathetic people in England that would transmit information to the, to the Germans. Along the south coast, in fact, around all the coast of the United Kingdom, if you walked into a pub, you'd see big notices saying, loose lips sink ships yeah. and uh, the walls have ears all this sort of thing consequently the efforts of uh, coastal command and the merchant navy were very much suppressed during the war which is why you probably didn't know much about it now we used to call it the silent service in the beginning in 1939, Coastal World was so badly um, equipped that it had it had um, very poor airplanes to assist the, the Navy. Oh, yeah, I was going to mention, there's quite a number of West Australians there that signed in on 10 Squadron. This, of course, is just the um, the officers' mess, where everyone signed a, a thing and we hung it on the wall. Uh, there were there were quite a few very famous names there. You can see W. R. McFarlane in the bottom left-hand corner, and that's the grandfather of uh, Fremantle. Luke Fremantle, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then you have various other people, Vic Murray, who's lovely wife is here with us today, uh, Ed Chittleborough, which was my navigator, oh, and various other names that you might recognize. So, we're on to Coastal Command, and then the aircraft that, that they had. Now, as you can see, they oh, yeah, this is the aircraft. They're pretty ancient aeroplanes. I mean, <coughs> to patrol against U-boats with an old Anson or they had three squadrons of Sunderland, only a few Hudsons and uh, Ansons and the old Swordfish. They even had Tiger Moth <laughs> patrolling close into the coast and their armament was a very pistol. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of that was to, if they did see a U-boat or anything menacing, they could send up a very pistol and some, someone perhaps might come to their aid and, and do something about it. So that was uh, 1939. And uh, by 1941, uh, things had improved enormously. So we then had Catalinas, which gave us a little more range. We also had Liberators. Both fighters were turned out by the United Kingdom, and we had uh, a lot more squadrons of uh, Sunderland. When America entered the war, 
this changed the, the scene completely. You know, we're talking now of 1942, but still, we couldn't close the gap. The Atlantic Gap was where all the wolf packs operated because there was no aircraft could reach the center of the, the Atlantic to try and protect the convoys in that part of the world. So 1941 also assisted the Germans enormously because then they had built their U-boat pens all the way down the west coast of, of uh, France so they could, they could um, maneuver out across the, uh, the Bay of Biscay into the Atlantic much more easily than they had coming around the top of the United Kingdom, which they had to do initially. So they were in a very strong position in relation to uh, in relation to the um, the British Navy and, and the um, <coughs> Merchant Navy. The one thing that the, the British or the, the Coastal Command really needed was an aeroplane that could reach the, the gap in the middle. The the wharf packs would congregate in that area and they would spread out. We're talking, we're talking about 30 or 40 U-boats, that's quite a lot of U-boats, and they would spread <laughs> out in the hope of one of them would spot a, a uh, convoy coming through, then they would radio the rest, and they would then try and uh, um, meet up to make a pack of, uh, of U-boats. Now, a U-boat on the surface can do 18 knots. A convoy is usually 8 knots. So you can see they have a tremendous advantage. They would keep out of sight of the convoy and the escorts, and they would get ahead of the convoy. They would then wait until the, the convoy actually caught them up. Then they would only attack, attack at night. They would... Uh, and enter enter the uh, the convoy, which might be up to 50 ships. And the arrangement with the navy was that if a, a, a ship was attacked, that they would immediately send up a flare. Now the idea of the flare was to allow the escorting naval ships to try and locate the U-boat, which would be close to the ship that it, it uh, torpedoed. But unfortunately, it also lit up the convoy, which gave these uh, enormous number of U-boats a tremendous advantage because they could then see what they were aiming at. After a, a night of chaos, they would then they would then move out of the uh, range of the naval vessels, vessels and wait until the convoy passed them. They would then come to the surface, put on 18 knots, and go ahead of the convoy and wait for it yet again. Now, that would go on for three awful, dreadful nights. And in the worst of the situation, they were sinking something like 1,000 ships a night. And we didn't know much about that. We, uh, in the air, we couldn't assist them at night. We had no radar that was good enough until ooh, 1943. And, um, and that meant that uh, at night they were pretty unprotected. The, uh, the merchant <coughs> navy didn't have very many ships to help them. The Royal Navy didn't have enough, and it wasn't until 1943 that the Americans began to be able to put aircraft and, and additional ships to, to assist. By that time, Churchill was extremely worried. Everyone in England was on very severe rations, and if the Americans hadn't entered the war, he felt that England might be starved into surrender. So, 
the, the, the battle, the battle of the Atlantic then swayed one way and the other. We, the, 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 uh, the British broke the Enigma and that meant that they could uh, find out where the, the wolf packs were gathering and perhaps be able to divert their, their, um, their convoys away from them. Uh, on the other hand, the Germans uh, developed a thing called METOX, which managed to pick up our radar waves or pulses from 30 miles away. So they could then crash dive and, and uh, get out of the way if we found them. And we were likely to find them in 43 because our radar had improved enormously. However, they only took 30 seconds to, to crash dive, which wasn't long. And we always, always flew at about 1,500 feet because we wanted minimum time to get down to attack them. However, 30 seconds is not very long. And uh, even even then, to try and to try and uh, improve the situation, we used to have a, a big stopwatch in the, on the uh, climbing panel. And if the uh, if the U-boat uh, submerged, you would hit the stopwatch and uh, and then time it as to where you would lay your depth charges ahead of the swirl, in the hope of hitting them. And uh, you wouldn't know, of course, whether they had actually turned port or starboard, <laughs> or whether they in fact had gone straight ahead. So it was a bit of guesswork there. I would like to mention a fellow called Johnny Walker. Now, nothing to do with whiskey. When, when the Americans came in and produced a lot more ships for us, uh, the, the Royal Navy decided to have uh, units uh, that could assist if necessary. And these units were, um, were say, four or five very fast ships uh, with, filled with uh, depth charges. And uh, if a convoy was in trouble, it could radio and these escort ships would tear out to try and assist them. Now, one of these uh, little fleets was uh, run by a fellow called Captain Johnny Walker. And he was so persistent that he actually sang 20 U-boats. He gained, this is absolutely unheard of, he gained four DSOs. Not just one distinguished order, but four of them. And no one's ever done that before. Um, he was so dedicated that uh, he wouldn't give up at any time. And finally, he died in 1944 of exhaustion. <laughs> now, at last we had long-range liberators, and that began to close the gap. So, the things were turning our way, and in 19, at the end of 1943, Things were looking a lot brighter for the Battle of the Atlantic on the, uh, on the English and American side. So that's a little picture showing you the gap. I mean, we had initially had ship, uh, aircraft that could reach it, but they couldn't stay there, so there wasn't much point. And initially we had nothing to help the convoys at night because our radar wasn't good enough. In 1943, we could actually go out there at night and circle the, uh, the convoys, and we could see on our radar, which was known to the bomber commanders, H2S, uh, we could see on our radar the, the convoy, and if anything arrived that wasn't part of the convoy, then we could attack it. And they developed things like uh, lee lights, which were on the front of aircraft, that were lit up as you approached. They also had flares that you dropped out of the bottom of the, uh, the back end of the, of the aircraft to light up the, um, uh, the, the enemy as you attacked. So to give you an idea of what would happen was that you were on patrol 
and you found something on a radar and you turned towards it, you would immediately run out your eight depth, char eight depth charges underneath the wings and then concentrate on the, the radar operator directing you towards the target. You would fly at 50 feet, which was always a bit dicey at night, particularly if you had a, a big swell. Um, and then at 800 meters you'd drop, and you'd drop all of them. And the difficulty was at night that when you opened a lee light or you threw flares out to find the U-boat, that the glare was such that, you know, 50 feet is not far, so you, it was a very risky situation. And you therefore handed over to the first officer who would only fly on instruments, and you would concentrate on pressing the buttons to drop the, drop the um, torpedo step charges. We were in a much stronger position. We then go on to the picture of, uh, there's an Enigma which really saved the day for the Battle of the Atlantic. And the next one, please, Brian. Oh, that's my crew. Uh, we were all done up in our very best to have a photograph so we could send home to our family. As you can see, there's uh, quite a number of guys there, but it was a big airplane. A little about the, uh, the Sunderland. Well, that's me. Um, we we had a now. Let me think. Um, Fighter Command had about two uh, two hundred hours for a for a uh, tour, and they could fit a lot of very short uh, missions in that because you know they didn't have much range. Now, Bomber Command was thirty two missions, and they could get over that in a, in a few months. Coastal Command was a year and a half or a thousand hours. So what the, the, our squadron did was to put new pilots like myself at that time in the right-hand seat for the first 500 hours of their operational tour. And if they proved satisfactory, they could then be given a, a boat of their own. Funny how we call them boats, isn't it? <coughs> so, can we have another one? Ah, now there's the, the flight deck of a, funny how we call it the flight deck. Actually, on the squadron we used to call it the bridge. <laughs> 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 I think it was that sort of semi-nautical thing. We used to talk about bollards and drogues and uh, you know, all sorts of things. The toilet on board was always called the heads. <laughs> so it was sort of pretty naval stuff. Oh, and here are the uh, the um, very pistol cartridges, which were the colours of the day. So if we ever entered anywhere near a, 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 um, a convoy, particularly in the early mornings when gunners were very uh, nervy, you had to shoot out the colours of the day to convince them that you you were friendly. And uh, if you didn't, you'd quite likely they'd shoot at you. Oh, I've got a note here about a pigeon. <laughs> we always carried a pigeon, so that if we could come down and land in, if the water was smooth enough, if we were in trouble, we could detach a note off on the pigeon leg and send him off. I've never known it to work, but we still carry the pigeon. <laughs> now, the aircraft alone, was honestly feared by the Germans. They didn't like it. Um, and we've been known to escape from eight JU-88s. Admittedly, the aircraft was so old that they had to beach it, but they shot down a number of those JU-88s at the same time. The aircraft had 16 guns, and that was an awful lot of armament. You had four forward firing guns for the captain so that he could use them on U-boat attacks and uh, you had a nose turret as well. And then you had two Vickers GOs out of the galley hatches, 2.5s out of the waist hatches, 
a mid-upper turret and four burnings in the tail turret. So that was a lot of guns. Uh, <clears throat> we were always flying fairly close to the water anyway because, as I said, we needed a very short time to get down to attack a U-boat. So the unprotected part of the aircraft was underneath, of course, and it didn't take us long to get down to low on the water if we were attacked. That meant that uh, we were at least protected. They couldn't attack us from underneath where we didn't have any armament. And uh, the, the Germans got around to calling us Fliegende Staffelschwein. <laughs> in, in English, that is the flying porcupine. <laughs> and as I say, they didn't like us. So, <clears throat> that's the aircraft, and this is coming ashore after an operation. The aircraft itself was comfortable enough. We had a, a wardroom, uh, we had a toilet, uh, we had a kitchen, and uh, on the uh, on the bridge, as we call that, um, quite comfortable space for a navigator, an engineer, and uh, two pilots, and another uh, pilot, if possible, <laughs> for working in the radar. So if we had three pilots on board, we used to circle, cir circulate them in one-hour shifts. And if we found the U-boat, we'd hurriedly take our, our right places. But the skipper always wanted to be in the left-hand seat at the right time. And the one thing that was problematic with the um, with the Sunderland was the old Pegasus engine. If you lost an engine and you were way out in the Atlantic somewhere, you were in deep trouble. Uh, you had to throw everything out. And, uh, and just hope that you might make it home. If you lost two engines, then that was the end of your year. And we had many people on the squadron that just simply disappeared. And we can only assume that that's what happened. You know, they lost an engine or due to enemy action, they, they lost engines and they just went in and that was the end of it. Sometimes <clears throat> pilots used to take the chance and try and rescue merchant navy, merchant navy personnel or shot down bomber command guys and many times because the <coughs> aircraft wasn't built for landing in the open sea they would end up with the survivors eventually the uh, the squadron brought out an order to say that we were not allowed to do that in the open sea and uh, still guys attempted it. Uh, I presume it was because they just couldn't bear to to see these fellows in the water and knowing that there was absolutely no hope for them, which there wasn't. I mean, they, they couldn't expect a POW camp. These guys were just going to die. So, <clears throat> so you know, it, it took a lot of nerve to just leave them there. Now, this particular picture is of interest, perhaps because if you were uh, over cloud for a long time and you got yourself lost and ended up on the coast of Ireland, there was no excuse for you to fly over uh, neutral territory. They had these plastered all around the coast of Ireland with a number on them, <laughs> and that number would correspond to a number on your chart. So that meant that you could uh, locate your position and, uh, and therefore you know. the uh, this one here I just threw it in because over Plymouth they had masses of these things uh, protect to the city against uh, JU-86's uh, um, low level dive bombers but of course it made it incredibly difficult for us to land in the sound. We had to dive and, and around these things. And at night it was absolutely ghastly. You, you didn't know too well where they were. 
And uh, one, of the, one of the hazards is a, a letter sent by Dwight Eisenhower just before D-Day to all the people that were going to be involved. Um, there weren't very many Australians involved in D-Day in relation to, you know, percentage-wise. It was all uh, British, American, and Canadian. The Australians that were involved were our own squadron and uh, Australians who were in other, a mixed squadron. Which probably accounted for why when they dished out their uh, Légion d'Honneur, it was a bit hard to find <laughs> Australians still standing uh, since there weren't too many there in the first place. And there's the aeroplane, 30 ton of it. And of course you, you know, they, everyone says, and I would agree with them, that it doesn't matter what aeroplane you fly, you fly it for six months and, and uh, you'll love it. You get so used to it. And of course that was the case with this thing. Even though it was poorly powered, uh, we, we, we really did enjoy it. It wasn't easy to fly in in the sense of, of landing. It, if you had a three foot swell, that was the maximum you could possibly cope with because otherwise you might knock your wing floats off and then the thing would just heel over and sink. So if you did attempt to uh, take off in a three foot swell, you had to ignore the wind and take off along the swell. And that wasn't easy because as the swell moved towards the shore, so your aircraft would move towards the shore. And you had to eventually get up enough flying speed to bump it onto the next one. One other story I'd like to pass on to you, and that was a, a story of a fellow called Ozzy Ferguson. Ozzy Ferguson was in charge of our, our um, maintenance on the squadron. And he was you couldn't have asked for a more dedicated man. He would not take any leave. He spent his entire time planning how he could improve the, the uh, Sunderland, and he did so. He added all those guns to it, in conjunction with the manufacturers, of course, but the CO was uh, all on his side, and he, he uh, sent him off to uh, Short Brothers, that built the aeroplane to modify it to the conditions that, he, that uh, we thought was ideal. Now that, that meant that we uh, originally bought Mark 1 Sunderlands and end up, ended up, thanks to Ozzy Ferguson, with Mark 5 Sunderlands. And the old Peggy's were replaced eventually by Pratt & Whitney uh, twin row wasps. Ozzy would not take any leave. He I was, couldn't think of a more dedicated man. Towards the end of the war, the CO insisted that he take leave. So he did so. He went up to London. He was in London two days and he was killed by a flying bomb. Now we're back to a picture of the squadron. Ah, oh, there it is. And that one is just to show you how Australians love the snow. Probably most of them have never seen it before. But they're all holding snowballs, and there's no doubt about that they threw it at the cameraman when it finished. <laughs> so, if I may, I'd like to say a few words about the Merchant Navy. The Merchant Navy were uh, 185,000 strong. The casualties were 33,000. And that was the highest attrition rate of any of the armed services. They were only ever civilians. They were never ever given a medal for bravery. It took the Australians and the Canadians 50 years to accept them as veterans of the Second World War. When they, their ships were sunk, their pay was stopped.
because the civil shipping company said, well, you're not working for me anymore. <laughs> you know, if, if they were rescued, which is very doubtful, they then had to find their own way home. They had, um, I suppose, recover would be the word. And then they went back to the shipping company and asked for their job back. Now, who would do that? I mean, I'd have to be given a medal to do that. And yet they did. They just kept it up. And the awful thing about it was to arrive at a convoy at dawn, which in the early days was all you could do because you didn't have the facilities to help them at night, and to see the chaos that the U-boats caused, the wreckage and, you know, I just don't, don't like to talk about it. It's, it's something that I, I, I can never get rid of. So you can see why it's always been a bit of a hobby or worse than mine. I think they were very badly treated. And after 50 years at the end of the war, they said, you can, you can have some campaign medals for a very small return. Now, we go on to V-Day, which was great. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, looking across Plymouth Sound from our and the, the mess and the and, uh, beautiful view across there, cluttered with ships as usual. And then, uh, and then the picture of Willie Allison. <coughs> Willie was a great mind, mate of mine, and he joined up at the same time as I did. He was shot down over England, and he um, he died near Bath in Somerset. Willie Allison's mother and my mother were great friends, so they asked me would I, when I visited my grandmother who lived in Bath, uh, take a photograph of Willie's grave, which I did. And I got somebody to, do, to uh, take a photograph of me looking at Willie's cross there. So, I think that I bored you enough now. <laughs> So that was the end of all that, and uh, I can only say that the comradeship from that squadron is something that it will never die. It's the strongest thing, and yet, strangely enough, in the short number of years that you were there in relation to your entire lifestyle and lifetime, why is it that that bond is so strong? Anyway. I think everyone in the armed services would feel the same way. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sure I've used up too much time. <laughs>